So hello everyone. I, on behalf of the Institute Colloquium Committee, I uh, welcome you all to today's talk by Professor Nitin Saxena. So before starting, uh, I would like you to request everyone to either switch off their mobile phones or put it on silent mode. So let me start with uh, introducing Professor Nitin Saxena. So Professor Nitin Saxena is an uh, N. Rama Rao Chair Professor uh, in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, he is perhaps the most well known for his uh, 2002 breakthrough result, the AKS uh, primality test. So this was the first uh, efficient uh, algorithm to check whether a given number is prime. Um, so in fact, he was uh, an undergraduate student at the time of this work and uh, uh, later on he continued uh, his PhD at IIT Kanpur. So besides uh, primality, he has made uh, numerous other fundamental contributions in the areas of uh, computational complexity theory, algebra, geometry, and uh, number theory. Uh, he's, he's a recipient of uh, many prestigious awards, including the Fulkerson Prize, the Godel Prize, and the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, among others. Uh, he's also a recipient of the IIT Bombay International Award uh, for 2023, which he just received yesterday. Uh, the purpose of this award is to recognize the contributions of researchers and academicians in the field of engineering and technology who may have uh, professional contributions over the last 10 years with impact in the real world. The award acknowledges uh, Professor Saxena's famous results and publications in a broad areas of theoretical computer science with the focus on algebraic complexity and number theory. His uh, research impact is uh, also visible through uh, 24 master students and uh, 15 uh, PhD students he has supervised. And uh, I had the good fortune to be one among them. Um, his social impact uh, extends to conducting uh, various courses on NPTEL, uh, inspiring young minds in mathematical computing and uh, encouraging AI product development in the Indian setting. So, without uh, further uh, ado, I'll invite Professor Saxena to deliver his talk. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you for the generous introduction and this generous invitation to IIT Bombay. It has been my, it is my first time I visit IIT Bombay. I waited too long and finally it has paid off. So, thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so it's a very uh, general title that my talk has. Uh, algebra powers computation. I will of course not talk about everything in algebra or everything in computation. I will only focus on things that I have been interested in and I will only list problems that I have worked on. So I will have few slides and feel free to interrupt me whenever you want to ask questions. I am in no hurry to finish the slides. So <coughs> you are welcome to interrupt. For whatever art I will use, I thank the artist. The, the artwork is not mine. So what is computing? Uh, so this was, uh, this was asked many times in many forms and ultimately it was answered, or, or actually it was also answered many by many people, but in the most convincing way it was answered by Turing, uh, by defining computation in terms of a mathematical model, uh, a machine which is now, now called Turing machine. <coughs> so Alan Turing postulated a simple very general mathematical model for computing. So what this machine is, is that it has a finite control here where I show four states. So Q0 is the start state and H is the halt state or final state. And in, in the middle there may be finitely many other states. There is a, there is a head uh, which works on the tape and the tape is infinite. So t think of tape as, t as an infinite hard disk. And uh, it will, the head will basically move left or right and it will, it can read or it can write alphabets on the cell. And based on what it sees and what the transition function is, it takes the next step. Okay, so this is, this is very, very simple uh, machine and uh, believe it or not, there is no machine known to humankind which is more powerful than this. Okay, everything that we do or we have done can be simulated on this machine. Okay, so this is whatever it does, we call that computation 
following Turing. And algorithm uh, or Turing machine or a computer program for this talk will be the same thing. We'll use this interchangeably because there is no other definition known to us. Uh, so algorithm or a computer program, let's say a C program or a Python program, all these things are actually just, at the end of the day, they can be written in as simple a recipe as that of a Turing machine. <clears throat> so I'll shorten it to TM. Uh, so this is what computation is, uh, and Turing machine is actually a real computer in the sense that it is highly iterative, and every step is trivial. Okay, in your computer, when you look at the things which are happening inside the microprocessor in a millisecond, these are very, very simple things. Just a bit is picked from this register and moved to that register or in a register, the bit is flipped. So very trivial things are happening every millisecond. And it's highly iterative in the sense that a lot of things happen in one second. Millions of things happen in a second. And so cumulatively something magical happens, but when you look at uh, uh, just a millisecond screenshot, it's something very trivial. Okay, so same thing also happens in Turing machine. So Turing machine is, is a real computer. The only difference is that on a real computer you have a finite hard disk, while in TM for mathematical reasons we take infinite hard disk. <clears throat> and uh, so I will not, my talk or my interest is not in working with Turing machine. I work with circuits and uh, so I want to go there quickly. So how about an electronic circuit, right? So electronic circuit has, is basically these microprocessor chips or AND or NOT gates. And uh, uh, how does that fit in the Turing machine? And how does it, is it a better model to study computation? Uh, and so my argument will be that yes, it is a better model and all my future slides will talk about circuits. <coughs> So algebraically, it's a neater model uh, to capture real computation because uh, I can make sense of uh, atomic operations more algebraically. I can say that uh, an atomic operation is either an addition operation or a multiplication operation happening in some field. And at every point, I am computing a polynomial. Okay, so I can invoke uh, results from the polynomial ring from algebra and so on, which is what I prefer to do in my work. So I move to uh, the definition of valiant, which is the definition of algebraic circuit computation or model. Uh, so what is that? <clears throat> so valiant defined this uh, few decades after Turing. Uh, it's, it has this simple picture. So in the leaves, you'd see uh, variables uh, or constants, like 10. And uh, then the computation proceeds from the leaf so bottom to top. So it proceeds from the leaves and uh, at every layer, Either addition happens or multiplication happens. So you, from variable, you get to a polynomial. And then from the polynomials, you get to bigger polynomials and so on. And ultimately, at the root, you get, for example, this, this polynomial, x plus y plus 10 to blue y. It's a quadratic polynomial. <clears throat> and we say that this polynomial has a circuit of size, whatever is the size of this graph. OK, so graph size is the resource here. I forgot to say that in Turing machine, the resource was, the cost was uh, how many cells you used and how much time you took, how many iterations there were, right? So, because time is a very important resource, as you are well aware of, you don't want to wait for an answer for very long. Because if you wait, for, if it waits for years, then it's essentially a useless algorithm, right? So you want answers in limited time and limited space. Uh, that, so those are the resources in Turing machine. Uh, in circuit, the resources are how big is the circuit, which is basically how much do you have to invest in the chips. So how many wires are there, how many connections are there, how many chips are there. Uh, that basically is the main resource. There is another resource which is not very minor, uh, which is this uh, depth. So how many layers are there from leaf to root? That kind of estimates the time. So in parallel, these processors are working, but when you go from leaf to the root, how many steps you have to take, that essentially is proportional to the time. <clears throat> so here also there is time, which is depth, and there is size, which is the cost of fabrication. 
Yeah, number of edges and uh, vertices. Yes, number of vertices. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is a graph representation issue. Uh, there are many things which we don't count, and practically we should count it, which is, for example, how big are these constants? So this 10 is very minor, but suppose it said here 10 raised to 10, or it said here e, or it said pi, or it said even square root 2. So square root 2 is an infinite object in math. Square root 2 you cannot represent in any finite representation. It requires infinitely many digits. So what is the cost of that? Uh, I mean, in practice you would want to count it, but in this algebraic model we ignore that. We don't worry about constants. Constants can be anything. What we worry is what are these connections and how many, how many gates. It makes things cleaner for uh, algebraic analysis. So we, we ignore the constants in this, but practically you should <coughs> count that as well. So valiant formalized computation and resources using algebraic circuits, and what this gives birth to is uh, the VP, VNP question, uh, or the algebraic hardness question. So uh, basically what are the polynomials that are somehow natural polynomials, but when you write them down as a circuit, it requires big size. Okay, so one example is uh, if your polynomial has too many monomials. So for degree n uh, or even degree d and variables n, the number of monomials can be n plus d choose d. So which is like exponential in n and d. Uh, so if you have exponentially many monomials and it is possible that your polynomial has that many monomials, uh, then is there a circuit much smaller than that bound. If there is a circuit much smaller than that bound, then it's an interesting circuit. It is saying something highly non-trivial and structured about your problem. If not, then your polynomial is very hard. Okay, you are not able to solve it practically. So, so the question is about upper bound and lower bound. <clears throat> so upper, trivial upper bound is exponentially high. Are there interesting interesting results uh, or can you prove can you prove that as a lower bound or is there a is there a bound which is much smaller than that so those are the questions we are interested in obviously we believe that uh, uh, there are many many natural polynomials which will be very hard there will be no practical representation for that except the brute force one the one you get from the definition <coughs> uh, now the this VP, VNP question, I don't want, I cannot define this, uh, but if you have heard about the PNP question, it is the question of uh, uh, solving optimization problems. Okay, there are many, many problems in many, many areas of engineering and also humanities and economics and so on, which can be modeled as, uh, let's say, some sort of a linear program or semi definite program or something which uh, where uh, you have to find uh, in a big space of solutions the optimal solution or few optimal solutions or an approximation to optimal solutions uh, and uh, there are like these connections that that cannot be done there there is no practical way to do it and if you found a practical way then you will actually also find a practical way to solve many other thousands of problems which humanity has been trying to solve. So these are called NP hard problems or NP complete problems. And uh, the NPP question is uh, whether those very hard problems have practical algorithms. We conjecture not, but there is no proof. Proof is still outstanding. So this is one of the millennium questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a it's a question for which there is actually a monetary award, which is the least part of the game. It's a much more important question than just a million dollars. Uh, VP is the valiant version of that, which is uh, uh, analogous thing, but now in the algebraic model. Okay, so let me, let me just stop at that unless you have more questions. <clears throat> So, uh, so I proceed, so algebraic circuit has, uh, what are the parameters? The parameters are there are constants 
appearing, there are variables appearing, uh, there is size of the graph, and there is depth of this uh, of this rooted graph. <coughs> and uh, yeah, and then there are once you have a model, uh, you can classify the problems according to what you can write down as a circuit. So there are the, there is this uh, there are these bubbles. Uh, each bubble represents a set of infinitely many problems, and each uh, represents uh, a type of representation. So VF is basically formulas. VBP is algebraic branching programs. VP is uh, small circuits. VNP C is essentially very hard problems, NP-complete problems. And uh, VNP is this big thing, uh, which contains uh, almost any problem of interest. That's the biggest space of problems. Uh, okay, any general questions here? Yes. No, no, no. So that's a great question. Uh, I may not be able to convince you immediately, but uh, the way problem solving is defined via circuits, uh, algebraic or not. Uh, it is inherently, or by definition, it is much stronger than Turing machines. Because uh, <coughs> solving a problem in this world, in the world of circuits means that for input of size n, uh, you have to fabricate a circuit. So for every input size, there may be a very different looking circuit fabrication method. While in Turing machine, you have to come up with an algorithm that works simultaneously for all input sizes. Like a C program or a Python program, it has to be the same program no matter what the input is, right? So in the same oblivious or general sense, uh, Turing machines also behave, but not circuits, because in circuit, you can fabricate very differently circuits for n, n plus 1, n plus 2, 10n, and so on. So it can solve, uh, just by definition, it can solve more things than Turing machine. Uh, which may suggest that this is a useless definition. Why am I giving it so much of arbitrary power? Uh, so to appreciate that, you have to look at the opposite scenario, which is uh, suppose I show that a problem that I'm interested in doesn't have small circuits. So then I will be proving a very strong statement because irrespective of I having arbitrary way of designing circuits for arbitrary input sizes, still I cannot produce or generate small circuits. So it's a stronger hardness result than saying that something is hard on Turing machine. It's actually, in a way, much stronger to say that it's hard over circuits. And for our natural problems, we don't expect any difference. So if we expect it to be hard for Turing machine, we also expect it to be hard for circuits. So we basically get of the ability to apply more math here, and then we hope to get stronger results. But it's stronger than Turing machine. So, uh, so logically, would VP not equal to VNP implies V not equal to AP, or the other way around? Uh, yes, the other way around. Uh, if, uh, if you show that SAT is hard, then uh, you, in a way, intuitively, you also show that counting SAT, counting the number of satisfying assignments is also hard. So it's, uh, I mean, it can be formalized. I am not making a theorem statement, but it can be formalized. There is a way to formalize to say that to prove P different from NP, you have to show uh, VP different from VNP. It's an intermediate result towards the final goal. Uh, so space here is basically size of the graph. Yeah, but you can connect one to n. Yeah, yeah. So you can have any any graph structure on the n variables x1 to xn. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> but I mean, you don't want to have cycles because they will not help in computation. 
it is at the end of the day, the computation is from bottom up, bottom to top, and it's a directed acyclic graph, and the root is unique. That gives the answer. So uh, modulo those basic natural assumptions. There is no other assumption. But you can deduce many things. You can, for example, layer the graph. So you can assume that addition multiplication uh, alternates. So those things you can achieve almost for free. Layered alternating gates and so on. <clears throat> Uh, any other question? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so my work is to study circuit problems where circuit I have defined like that. So problems means polynomials. So I study polynomials, multivariate polynomials, univariate polynomials over fields or over rings. Um, and uh, then I study uh, properties of circuits that may or may not compute those polynomials. <clears throat> so, uh, mo and more interestingly, I want to develop the relevant math which goes inside proving such results. Uh, so, the ultimate goal, of course, is to defictionalize the above picture. So, this picture that was there on the previous slide, I call it a fictional picture because uh, uh, when I'm s drawing these bubbles separated, I actually don't know that they are separated. So we formally don't know whether all these classes, they are equal or they are all different. Okay, we don't actually know VF different from VBP, different from VP, different from VNP. Everything may be the same. Hard problems may be easy problems, easy problems may be hard problems. Everything may be equal. Uh, although we don't conjecture that, but it's not ruled out, we don't have these results, these are all open questions. Valiant's central question inspired from PNP is that the biggest thing and this thing, VP, these two are separated. And then other classes are kind of refinements of PNP questions. Uh, yeah, so de-fictionalizing this picture, I have added one more thing here. This is called VNP bar. This is an object that contains, that, that, is, that could be even bigger than VNP. Uh, so this is the approximate polynomials. So here I'm adding one more relaxation that I don't compute the polynomial exactly, but approximately. It's called the border class. So the border of this could potentially be bigger. It's VNP bar. So separating all these things, de-fictionalizing that picture <coughs> is, uh, is basically what people in complexity do. Uh, be it Boolean circuits or algebraic circuits or Turing machines, they have this similar framework that they will define complexity classes, they will expect them to be different, and then they will try to show that it's actually, that that's the case. Um, so in algebraic complexity, steps have been taken towards that. Uh, there is, progress is impressive, but it's far from complete. Uh, and one thing, is that even with all the AI hype, uh, things which we show separate, things which we prove hard in this model, they will remain hard no matter what AI does. Okay, because uh, I mean the way, uh, the way these AI ML algorithms work, which potentially are solving NP hard problems, they're actually not solving the problem completely. They are solving it only for uh, input instances that appear in practice. Okay, so they are actually solving the problem for very small uh, density of instances. They are not solving everything. So when we say that, okay, our mathematical proofs show problems to be hard in the worst case, that remains true. No matter what the technology is, still the polynomials which are hard, they will remain hard. Okay, so you can only hope to solve these very hard polynomials or problems in some cases for some restrictions or for some interesting input situations, not for all. <clears throat> so the math is, uh, math subsumes uh, developments in other kinds of te technology. It's not that uh, these other technological improvements are a, are a genuine improvement in 
<coughs> mathematical understanding. Uh, yeah, so one problem that uh, I have, which is related to uh, this model, it's very simple to state, so I'll state it here, is the question of uh, checking whether a circuit is zero. Okay, the question of circuit com being exactly zero or non-zero. It's the question of PIT. It, this is short for polynomial identity testing. So what is an identity? So this, for example, is Euler's identity. It's very old, very famous in math. There are areas which were built on this identity. What it captures is, uh, it actually expresses a product of two sum of squares, again as itself. Okay, so the product of two sum of squares is again a sum of squares, exactly four in all cases. Okay, so this is a, this is a brilliant identity and uh, it was actually invented or it, be, it was made famous to prove something about numbers, that any number can be written as a sum of four squares. Okay, so this is called Lagrange's four square theorem. Uh, it is based on that identity. So if you haven't seen this, uh, this is the way to prove this is, Lagrange shows it for prime numbers, that primes can be written as sum of four squares, and then product of primes can be written as again sum of four squares because of Euler's identity. Okay, so <clears throat> the thing about these identities is that they have lots of variables, and they have a lot of stuff going on, which is very hard to check. Like, this has eight variables and uh, degree is four, total degree. So there are a lot of monomials inside and there is a lot of cancellation happening which sitting here looking at the slide you won't be able to verify. So I may well be presenting wrong identity here. Some plus may switch to minus and so on and you wouldn't notice because it's very hard to check these things. Uh, <clears throat> and that is what will happen with a circuit identity also. So a circuit may be capturing a complicated identity and uh, the question is how do you verify that what I'm saying is true, that the circuit is actually an identity. So that's the question. Test whether a given circuit, algebraic circuit is zero. That's the question of PIT, uh, polynomial identity t t t testing. Uh, <clears throat> now, can you think of a cheap heuristic to do this. Exactly, so like even in Euler identity, although this is much, much smaller than what I deal with, uh, if you had a small calculator, you can just substitute, let's say, AI is to be ones, BI is to be zeros, and then check whether left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. You don't need to multiply out everything. You can just substitute some small numbers and just calculate whether zero or whether uh, let's say number n is equal to number n. You get n both sides. So when that happens, well if that doesn't happen then it's not an identity. So then you are certain that there was a mistake. Uh, yeah, so I could have written this as this product minus the sum equal to zero. Yeah, I prefer to write it as an equality, but uh, I can just bring everything on one side. Uh, <clears throat> so it's ultimately the question of some big expression equal to zero, or equivalently whether two polynomials are equal. Uh, and when I say polynomials are equal, it's not a question of evaluation. It's a question of formally monomials should balance out, okay? So you can just do a random evaluation and check this. If it doesn't work, it's not an identity. If it works, if you get zero equal to zero, then it means that there is some confidence that it is zero, but you don't have 100% confidence, right? It's a, so th 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 this is what is called a randomized algorithm. So there is a randomized, very simple, fast algorithm to check whether an identity is actually an identity. <coughs> So, the, it, so this problem gets solved uh, practically because it's a practical solution. You are given a circuit. You know how the connections of the wires are. You can just feed the variables as random points, numbers, and get the answer, check whether the answer is zero. It's a very fast algorithm. You can simply code it. 
So what is open here? The open question is, you have to do this without uh, randomization, without using probability. So you need to find a more structural solution, which we call deterministic polynomial time algorithm, <coughs> uh, to be 100% sure that a given circuit is zero. <coughs> so that's an open question. And uh, I mean, it motivates new tools to study algebraic computation when we give solutions of this type, deterministic polynomial time solutions. We have to actually do far, far more work than what we did with this random evaluation. It was very cheap. But then it doesn't tell you anything about the structure of the identity or structure of the circuit. But to make it deterministic, to de-randomize that algorithm, you will actually have to invent some new structural properties or discover structural properties of circuits. <coughs> so for example, <coughs> uh, this identity, so what are identities good for, right? So, so look at this uh, expression, x plus 1 to the n is equal to x to the n plus 1 mod n. If this happens, what does it say about n? Have you seen this before? When is this thing an identity? So what, in case you, do, you haven't seen the notation, it, mod n just means that uh, you are computing the remainder by dividing by n. Okay, like the first day of a week and the eighth day of a week are, are the same days. So that computation is mod seven. So the same thing we are doing with mod n here. So this is a polynomial x plus one to the n, and this is a polynomial x to the n plus one. Now if the two, uh, the two remainders you get here, modulo n division, if they are the same, what does it, so when does it happen? Uh, yes, but this is something much simpler. <clears throat> yeah, so somebody said that this means that n is prime, right, which is absolutely right. So, so this identity exactly captures primality of n. Okay, so identities can capture um, like amazing things very compactly. Uh, so for, for example, here it is capturing that n is prime and which is a very, uh, it's a very amazing thing because primality, the way it is defined is uh, there should be no prime between two and n minus one that divides n, right? So it's a very uh, kind of a trivial definition, but somehow that identity is not talking about any such thing. So this, this, this identity is, is, is more computational, it's very compact, and it is making a statement about polynomials. Right, when primality itself is not a question of polynomials, it's a question of just numbers from one to n. So, so this, this is a completely different way of something you have seen in school, right? So, so the question is if I can somehow test this fast, then I can find a way to test primality very different from what it is defined. Right? It's, it will be a completely new insight. And that will happen via PIT. So, so yeah, so now I give you some uh, versions of PIT results that, that I have with co-authors. So first is primality testing, which is this. So how do I, given a number n, how do I test this fast? So we found a way, and that was the first way to do primality in deterministic polynomial time. <clears throat> uh, second is a version of PIT where uh, you are not allowed or you cannot see the in specifics of the circuit. So it's a black box. You only are given a black box. Input is n variables. Output will be one value. Uh, so you feed in values, you get an answer, okay? So it's a black box and uh, in this presentation, you want to check whether the black box is an identity. Okay, without looking at the inside, you want to check whether it's an identity. <clears throat> uh, so this is a very uh, important version of uh, PIT. 
because uh, here you have to actually design what is called a hitting set. You have to design a set of magical points such that no matter what the black box is computing, if it is computing non-zero, one of your points will give the answer non-zero. It hits any black box. It's a hitting set. <clears throat> yes? Yeah, so the thing I'm skipping is uh, it's not, it cannot be an arbitrary circuit. It has to be a circuit of size S. So obviously you know how many variables there are because that's the input being fed. Let's say that is N variables. Plus you are also given a promise that the black box contains a circuit of size S. So that parameter is important. Otherwise, I mean, you don't even know what you are fighting against. Is it N or two raised to N or two raised to two raised to N? How many nodes in the graph there are? Then you wouldn't even know that. So it will be actually provably impossible to solve. So we don't want to go there. The, the bound is given and then you have to do everything kind of fast in proportion to S. Your speed should be proportional to S, whatever parameter it, it is given. But other than that, you don't know anything else. The circuit structure, you don't know. You can't see the connections. <clears throat> yeah, so that and then uh, I have a sequence of results where uh, uh, where incidence geometry structures were utilized in identities. Uh, this, was, this was already interesting for uh, depth three circuit. So which is basically a sum of uh, product of linear polynomials. So when are such things zero? What are the identities that such a circuit contains? <clears throat> so in that, uh, what was important is uh, a concept in algebra called algebraic dependence. So for example, so I gave it, everything in this talk is just by examples. I will not give you proper definitions. So, so one concept which is helpful in uh, unfolding uh, incidence geometry in identities is this uh, concept of dependence. So you know what, when vectors are linearly dependent, and this is a generalization of that concept of linear algebra to polynomials. So why do I call x1, x2, and x1 square plus x1, x2 dependent? Well, because there is a polynomial in which if you substitute this, you will get zero. Okay, basically, you square the first thing, you multiply the two things, first two things, you add them, and then you subtract from the third one, and you will get zero. Okay, so there is a, there is a polynomial relationship between these three polynomials. So whenever there is a polynomial relationship between three polynomials, we call them dependent, right? What is the example of three polynomials where there is no such dependency? Yeah, so necessarily you have to take three variables. Okay, it's a, it's a homework exercise. It's not completely trivial. Uh, so if you take three polynomials in two variables, they are always dependent. But if you take three polynomials in three variables, then you can get examples of independence. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, these dependencies can be complicated. And uh, as the number of variables increase, as the degree increases, it might be difficult to see actually that there is dependency. So this is the question of algebraic dependence. It came out of uh, these incidence geometric studies. And it was helpful as a higher dimensional rank concept in these results. So I just wanted to mention this example. <clears throat> uh, another concept is that of duality. So what is duality uh, in circuits? So for example, uh, in my circuit, there may be such an expression, sum of xi's raised to d. Can I transform this and get a different representation which is somehow simpler? So for example, can I express this via some transformation as a product? So instead of a power, can I express it as a product? Do, do you think it is possible? Are there these polynomials fi such that this is equal to product of fi's? Where fi's are univariate. I mean, you can show again pretty easily that this is not possible. Uh, so we relax it further. We want to write 
sum of xi is raised to d as a sum of such things. So instead of just uh, asking for a product of univariates, sum of product of univariates. Okay, so that is the that is the idea of duality, basically rewriting an expression in a different way. And when I go to this this kind of products, there are certain advantages. I understand things better, and I can solve PIT. I can solve PIT. I can prove other theorems like about lower bounds, upper bounds, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> So that is one thing which uh, which happens in circuits. Uh, the final concept I want to mention is called bootstrapping in circuits. Uh, so what is bootstrapping? Bootstrapping is uh, essentially this picture shows you pretty well that uh, working on very, very tiny models and using those results to make a deduction about big models. Okay, so bootstrapping means uh, it's a theorem that we proved that if we can understand very, very tiny models. So tiny models means that some of the parameters are very small. Either the depth is very small or the number of variables is very small or the degree is very small, arbitrarily small. And if I make, uh, if I can solve questions for that small parameter, I also prove a result about general parameters. Okay, so that, that connection is the bootstrapping connection. So one place where this was, uh, this ended is uh, this model, sum of squares it is called. So this is just one variable <coughs> and these are n polynomials in one variable and I am taking sum of their squares. Uh, so the result that we were able to prove here is if you can prove uh, just moderate lower bound, you can come up with a polynomial f which is moderately hard in this representation, then you will show vp different from vnp. Okay, so the central question in uh, algebraic complexity, we relate that central question which is a very general question because I mean the circuits have all kinds of crazy things happening, many variables, addition gate, multiplication gate, general graph, and then you compute the polynomial. And here all that is happening is uh, sum of squares of univariates, right? So this is a much, much simpler, again, this is a small plant compared to the big plant, big tree. But if you can prove lower bounds and moderate ones for this small plant, then it will actually imply something about, it will imply VP different from VNP. Yeah. <clears throat> lower bound for a explicit polynomial f. Some come up with some uh, natural univariate polynomial f. Okay, so let me be specific. Suppose f is a degree d, its coefficients are somehow explicit, uh, known to you. And you can prove a theorem that uh, expressing this as a sum of squares requires let's say d raised to two-third many monomials in these fi's. So for representing d monomials on the left hand side, on the right hand side I need let's say slightly above square root d many monomials. So that's a lower bound, it's an interesting lower bound. <clears throat> if you prove that lower bound then, then it will imply that vp and vnp are different. So a very, very moderate lower bound will imply final result in complexity. So that is kind of the one highlight of bootstrapping. There are many other results. There are also bootstrapping results for identity testing. <clears throat> but this is the kind of the spirit. Again, it's a, just a, I'm advertising an example, that's all. So yeah, this finishes, I think, the first part. Any questions here? I mean, general questions? <clears throat> so does anybody know what, how much time do I have? Mm -hmm. 15 minutes, okay. So let me move to the other part which is uh, uh, not algebraic complexity but something related which, we, which I call algebraic algorithms. So this, is, this contains computational algebra, number theory and 
such problems that I have worked on. So again, I'll give you some examples, uh, and hopefully you will see the, uh, the interest. Uh, so the first thing is this uh, Newton iteration, which is highly popular in whatever area of engineering you pick. Uh, so what is this? So Newton iteration is uh, you want to find a, a real root, or Newton wanted to find a real root of fx equal to 0. <coughs> And uh, he gave this iterative algorithm, which will start at some x0. And of course, fx0 is not 0. x0 is not a root. But it will be used to get closer to a root, which is x1, which again will not be a root. But it will be used to get closer to a root, which is x2. And ultimately, you will be extremely close to this root, which is the red dot. Right? So in three steps already, it converges uh, very fast and very close to an actual root. Right? So this is the, the Newton iteration. And it has, obviously, needless to say, it has all kinds of generalizations known. You can generalize it to multivariate polynomials. You can generalize it to uh, optimization algorithms. You can use it in the form of gradient descent to solve AI problems. You can do it inside deep learning and so on. So it is used everywhere in, in many, many uh, guises. So what is my interest in this? So my interest is to find uh, uh, roots of multivariate polynomials. Okay, so a circuit is given, given in the input. And I want to, let's say, find the factor of the circuit. Okay, or I want to find a root of a univariate polynomial or I want to find a factor in general of multivariate or univariate. Uh, so, <clears throat> the, so, so one thing which is uh, more than Newton is, uh, non, is uh, similarity or non-simplicity. So the issue is that if you have seen this analysis of Newton iteration, the rate of convergence or whether it will go anywhere at all depends on uh, simplicity of the root very strongly. So the root, the red root, should have multiplicity 1. What is multiplicity? So like x equal to 0 has multiplicity 1 root, and x, x square equal to 0 has multiplicity 2 root. So if your polynomial was like x square, uh, it, the root that it has and the only root is x equal to 0, but it's not simple. It has non-simplicity. Um, and that, that actually creates problem in the analysis of Newton iteration. It won't work. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, the steps that the Newton iteration will have, they, will, they won't even be defined. They'll be ill-defined. You'll be kind of dividing by zero. So if you coded it directly, then your algorithm may say that you are doing division by zero. So you have to adapt it to make it work beyond the case of Newton for non-simple roots, and that is needed in uh, these circuit versions. So we have proved, uh, we have adapted and uh, proved and work with circuit versions uh, where we don't assume too much simplicity. We try to go away from that. Yeah, and in general, uh, factoring polynomials over various rings. So. Factoring polynomials over integers, modulo primes, prime powers, p addicts, and and so on. <clears throat> so what is this? Uh, what is this question? Yeah. So again, just to give you an example, it's a curious example. So this, believe it or not, this is a this is a meaningful identity. So square root two is the sum of three and seven and two times seven square and six times seven cube and so on. Okay, so to, to make sense of this, obviously it doesn't make sense over integers, but it makes sense over uh, seven addicts. Okay, so this is a completely different arithmetic. It's an arithmetic which is quite uh, uh, utilized in computer science. There are many uh, situations in computer science where this, this thing is useful, seven addicts. So what is happening here is you s we are actually saying that square root two is three, not seven. Then we are saying that square root 2, square root 2 is 3 plus 7, 
mod 7 square. And then we are saying that square root 2 is 3 plus 7 plus 98 mod 7 cube and so on. Okay, so this is a different arithmetic, it's the mod arithmetic, but it can be taken to mod 7 to the infinity. And when you reach 7 to the infinity, you have reached 7 addicts. Okay, so that is the that is the word where this square root 2 is being computed. So these are the questions of uh, factoring polynomials because this is kind of factoring x square minus 2. x square minus 2's root or a factor is square root 2, plus minus square root 2. So, so yeah, the question of factoring polynomials in these different words, in these weird words, uh, g requires different machinery. <clears throat> and I have worked on all these sorts of cases. Uh, finally, I want to talk about approximative model or approximative roots. Uh, so what is that? So suppose I give you these two polynomials, x equal to 0 and xy equal to 1. Right now you can see simply that there is no common root because x equal to 0 has to be the case if there is a common root. And in that case, xy minus 1 will become minus 1. So it cannot become 0. So there is no simultaneous root of this system. But there is an approximative root. What is that? So approximative root is you take x to be very close to 0 and then you take y to be very big. Right? So epsilon and 1 over epsilon, that's a common root with the understanding that epsilon is tending to 0. Okay, so that is the concept of, uh, this is the starting point of the concept of approximation for polynomials. Uh, I alluded to that when I showed you VNP bar, but I will not go into the proper de 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 definition of this. I think this example is enough to make you appreciate that there is a way to do approximation also in algebra, basically by introducing these epsilons <coughs> that are like very, very small quantities, close to zero. And uh, so it is close to zero, but not zero. So that one over epsilon is well defined. So one by epsilon is close to infinity, but not infinity. Okay, so that ability is there. And you can ask about now also systems having an approximative root. Like this has an approximative root. So which systems have approximative root, which systems don't have. Uh, so yeah, so the, the above was for actual roots. And this last point is for uh, non-actual roots approximative roots. So there are a sequence of results about this. Uh, yeah, and then uh, there are more problems in computational algebra that I have worked on. So algebraic dependence is one thing I've already mentioned, actually. Let me go over this, uh, skip this. Uh, then there are prob morphism problems, which is given algebras uh, or graphs or other mathematical objects, whether they are isomorphic. Can you find an isomorphism or an equivalence between them? There are questions related to that. There are questions about counting roots. For example, a system is given like x square equal to 0 mod p square. How many roots it has? So you can show that actually this system has p roots. But this is very simple to count. If, imagine if you had a more complicated say, system of polynomials mod p square. Can you count the roots efficiently? So that is one question. And finally, uh, in the last few years, I've been interested in computing, uh, computing zeta function analogs. Uh, so what is a zeta function? It's very hard to define right now. But let me just say this, that the classical zeta function, which was defined in 1800s by Riemann, is this. It's an infinite series. So zeta function following Riemann always contains infinite information. And there are there are conjectures we make, properties that we want to prove, which are to do with this infinite object, infinite information. Uh, and this, the thing that this is saying is currently the hardest qu question in math. It's called the Riemann hypothesis. So, the, 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 so this is the classical Riemann zeta function. I don't work on this. I work on things which are derived from here, which is uh, for, again, uh, polynomials over finite fields, more algebraic version instead of this highly analytic version. <clears throat> so suppose I give you a bivariate polynomial 
in two variables and uh, I want to count the number of points in finite field that this f has. So this n p raised to i f is the number of uh, points that this system has in a finite field of size p raised to i. It may be a finite field of size p raised to i or it may be mod p raised to i. There are multiple versions of counting. Uh, and based on that, I can write a generating function where it goes from t raised to zero to t raised to infinity. And at every monomial, it just has that count information. What is the count? How many points does it have? So this is a, again an infinite object. And uh, there are some amazing theorems that it satisfies. Uh, so one can show that this generating function has a simple form. It's not one over one minus t, but it's, uh, it is something like a polynomial in t divided by a polynomial in t. It actually converges to a rational function. And in computer science, you want to compute it. You want to compute that finite representation of the infinite object. Okay, how fast can it be computed? So this goes into uh, analogs of the uh, Riemann hypotheses. Many of them are actually proved in algebra. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I've solved some of these questions and many of these questions I'm still trying to solve. Uh, okay, now very quickly I go through the engineering applications. Uh, so applications in cryptography when you are feeling insecure. So cryptography builds on algebra. Uh, much of what cryptography uses in practice as well is actually based on number theory or curves, which is like elliptic curves, uh, counting points on elliptic curves, working with morphisms between elliptic curves, which is called the isogeny problem. And finally, also multivariate systems. So there are actually protocols like these digital signing protocols, which use uh, roots of multivariate polynomials, even quadratic polynomials. So post-quantum world in particular requires these new protocols. Uh, they basically because if, if quantum computers are built, then any question based on abelian group can be attacked. Any protocol based on abelian group can be attacked uh, because of the thing that somebody mentioned before, the discrete Fourier transform. So the discrete Fourier transform over abelian groups uh, is what quantum computers exactly solve. And classically, we don't know how to solve those questions. So in the post-quantum world, you have to avoid abelian groups. You have to rely on the non-abelian questions. And uh, there again, you have, to, you have to basically enhance your algebraic methods. So lattices and multivariate systems and isogeny of elliptic curves, these are some of the things that, on which the post-quantum crypto systems are based on. And uh, in general, you would want to rely on something that is very hard, like NP-hard, because quantum computers cannot solve NP-hard problems. There is no evidence whatsoever that if you develop quantum computers in practice, they will have any impact on NP-hard problems. <clears throat> so this, so this, these questions are interesting beyond quantum hype, uh, in the sense that even if quantum computers don't come about, Still, you want your systems, your crypto systems to be somehow resistant to all these things, even if these are imaginary attacks. Still, you want this kind of robustness. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so I will now finish with the last slide, which is uh, some other practical things. Uh, so, so you have heard about AI ML, no matter what area you are in or what department you are in. Obviously, these days, your emails are being written by chat GPT. So I think it impacts all of you. So there, the, uh, the innovation which happened uh, two decades back was uh, automating decision making. Right? So how, how do you automate decision making? It is automated by something which, is, which looks suspiciously similar to algebraic circuits. It's basically these, uh, on the left is your input layer. On the right end is the output layer. And in the middle, you have all these gates and you have these connections. Okay, so it's very much an algebraic circuit 
that will make your decision, except that you don't know what the algebraic circuit should look like. So it is learned. So the computer basically learns the edge connections, weights on the edges, and uh, also the parameter of the gates that you see here in blank, the parameters, what should the parameter be, those things are basically learned from training data. Okay, so this is the decision maker. This is called an artificial neural net network. Uh, I mean, it was originally inspired by the human brain, but it was soon realized that human brain is not this. So what human brain is, is currently still an open question. But let's say uh, a human brain which is not that intelligent is this. That is certainly true. Okay, but it's not the full power of, of the human brain. So the, the neurons are uh, basically of this type. So this is the dance of the neurons uh, inside, the, inside the ANN. So these are basically the, the these are the functions which uh, you may put, you may want to put in these gates. So this is the sigmoid function, this is the hyperbolic tan function, and there are multiple variants of it. ReLU is also pretty popular. Uh, yeah, so, so these functions, as you can see in very small font, uh, because I don't want you to actually get inside this, uh, but sigmoid is just one over one plus e raised to minus x. Okay, it's a very simple for function. It is clearly algebraic. I mean, it's like infinite power series, but ultimately you won't be able to, com you won't be able to compute infinite things. You only compute some kind of a polynomial approximation. So these are all actually algebraic gates and so it's, a, it's pretty much an algebraic circuit that is making your decision inside a neural network. And what is the challenge in this business is to find the right representation. How should the data be represented? How should it be converted into a linear algebra problem? And then how should the training be done? So, so that is very, very problem specific. In fact, that is very, very data specific. So that is where all the engineering goes of AI experts. And, uh, but if you see the math of that, the math is pretty standard. The tools are very standard. So these are called activation functions. These are all real algebraic functions, as you can see. Uh, yeah, and finally, uh, some of these things we actually use in my center, whose full form is this, CDIS. Uh, so we, we develop AI methods for mainly government applications. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I mean, it can be anything that promises to solve hard problems. So it can be for certain problems, quantum computers or it, for certain practical problems, it could be these ANNs, the neural networks. So those are the technological breakthroughs which promise to solve at least practical instances. But whatever I discuss, the abstract machinery like circuits and polynomials being hard, uh, that doesn't get affected by the by the claims which are made in practice. So what the claims that they make for technological improvements in practice only apply to uh, certain input instances. They don't apply at this very general level and worst case solutions. So whatever we will prove via algebraic circuit machinery, for example, or if you show that P is different from NP, the more classical problem, that will be genuine hardness. That hardness cannot be bypassed. It can only be bypassed for maybe very, very special type of situations, not in general. 
this is what I meant. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there are quantum circuits, of course. So quantum circuit model is well studied. They have different gates. Uh, they cannot do addition multiplication directly, but uh, I mean, they, their transformations have to be unitary transformations. But they can, of course, simulate Turing machines. Uh, yeah, I mean, not just that, it's of a very special type. It's a, uh, I mean, so it's a, uh, the input will not be just one thing, but a superposition of exponentially many things. So, so you have to prepare a state where there is exponential amount of superposition, and then the unitary transformation will act on this kind of a exponential dimension, a vector, and transform it. And after multiple transformations, it will kind of push the answer towards highest probability zone. Yeah, highest amplitude. <clears throat> so I have one question. So in the post-quantum cryptography, you mentioned that uh, so more complicated geometry tools yeah. are going to be useful. Yes. I was wondering if you could like slightly elaborate on that. Like, so do you foresee like algebraic geometry tools? To no, no, no. It is not that I foresee. There are already these things. They exist. So I mean, the the cartoon I had is it's an actual company. It does elliptic curve cryptography. You can actually pay them, and they will develop your protocol. They will implement it for you. You can use their protocol on your site. So, so these things, this is the simplest algebraic geometry possible. This is just elliptic curve. It's genus one. It's the lowest genus object that you can study above li linear algebra. Mm -hmm. And then there are variants of this uh, with. The company of <laughs> I don't think so. <coughs> no, I did not check that. Are you sure he has a company? Yes, he has a company. Oh. So then I should check, maybe the maybe it's one. So I just picked something off Google Images. Kumar Murthy is a he is a famous analytic number theorist based in Canada. Axero, yeah, yeah, right, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I think it is. It has a German base, but but you never know. I mean, these are international companies, so. Kumar Murthy may be in the board. I can't rule it out. But yeah, coming back to the question which was asked, this, these are not my, uh, I'm not foreseeing this. These, these things already exist for a long time. <clears throat> I just picked one simple example, but there are, there are things within elliptic curve that you can do like isogeny, which is more complicated than this picture. And uh, there are things that you can do with higher genus curves, for example, hyperelliptic curves, and so on. No, no, so this is not a, I mean, this is a simple example I put up, but the theory, the gap in the theory between elliptic curve cryptography and what is used, for example, in your bank transactions, HTTPS, RSA, this gap is humongous. So what you are using in HTTPS is just something as simple as multiplying numbers and taking remainder. Doesn't require much math. This, on the other hand, what elliptic curve cryptography requires, the math that it requires, will take a full semester to understand. So already to implement this, the, the amount of math needed, the algebraic geometry needed is, is intense. And it becomes more intense as you increase the genus. So there is a significant difference. Uh, yes. 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 <coughs> 
Chicago versus Washington set. So it's a post quantum Chicago state and all this that I think in Central Park. Yes. But even there, I sort of want to get your um, thoughts on that. These are again a very new problem in Central Park. Yeah. You know, last year some problem in Central we considered hard for a long time was broken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I think there is significant work that goes on. Yeah, they make progress every few years. So we get to hear it only infrequently. Uh, no, not yet. So I have worked on uh, some of the designs for multivariate digital signature schemes. But I haven't worked so much on elliptic curve and isogeny based methods. On the designing, yeah, right, yes. And which is in the multivariate system, it is the root finding for multivariate quadratic. That is NP-hard in general. So we want to rely on the NP-hardness of that and give protocols. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, because what happens is whatever people design and then also we design, somebody else finds a faster attack. So just being NP hard is not enough because as, as you were saying, doing encryption and decryption requires special structure. And the attackers are always able to exploit somehow that you don't foresee. But then after four, after a few years, they somehow find, use that against you, the encryption, decryption, simplicity. Yeah, that happens. <clears throat> but uh, I mean, I think the very promising methods are in lattices. So this is again a core area in computational number theory. Uh, and there are many, many developments in cryptography based on lattice theory. And many things have, after decades of work, has been made efficient or close to efficient. So th th those things I haven't even mentioned here. But it's again something very popular in this area. Yes. So, uh, is your work connected with computational proof checking or theorem proving? No. Okay. Uh, I mean, I like to prove theorems, <laughs> but not by machines. Okay. Yeah, I don't trust machines to prove theorems. <clears throat> Are there still some Raymond hypotheses or open questions? Uh, some of their particular hypotheses or all are like proved or? No, 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 no. What do you mean? The question I had on the board yeah. said that it is the hardest problem on earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even now. Even now. It, it is. is true today. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. So, any more questions? Okay. So, if uh, there are no more questions, uh, uh, I would request Professor Manoj Prabhakaran to. Uh, give Nitin a memento uh, as a note of thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Nitin, for the wonderful talk. On behalf of the Institute uh, Colloquium Committee, I thank everyone uh, for coming to today's talk and participating in uh, today's discussion. I also thank PRO's office for taking care of all the logistic arrangements and for the CDF staff for uh, helping with the recording. Uh, I invite everyone for the tea and coffee outside. Thank you. <laughs>